five minutes, what I'd like to talk to you about is this paradox. It's a paradox that I've dealt with uh, basically all my career because I've been very interested in innovation and also interested in knowledge. And the fact of the matter is that those two aren't always compatible. But I would like to convince you that, in fact, certain types of knowledge, namely deep smarts, and I'll tell you more than you want to know about that in a minute, underlie innovation at your firm. And that, to some degree, in some firms, you're in danger of losing some of those deep smarts and therefore uh, losing some of the opportunity for innovation that exists. So the paradox, as I said, is that knowledge both enables innovation and can inhibit it. And I'm going to spend more time telling you about the enhancement and the enablement than I am about the, in, the problems that knowledge can cause. But we've already heard about some of those in the, in the conference already. So let me start by saying what are deep smarts. The simple definition is business critical, experience-based knowledge. And I'm going to put quite a bit of emphasis on both of those, business critical and experience-based. It's what you have in your heads after you've been doing something for 10, 15, 20 years. And it's one of the most difficult things for you to transfer to other people because it's unique. Even if you're sitting next to someone who has the same educational background and some of the same industrial background that you have, your experience is unique to you. And so that's why it's difficult sometimes to transfer. Now, we all start at various activities as a novice. As I said, most of you are very experienced. You're expert in one or more areas. But let's say you wanted to go hang gliding or create a rap song or something new for the first time. You start as a novice, right? And then as you gain experience, you become more of an apprentice and a journeyman and then a master. And you'll notice that the ladder here, if I can get this right, the ladder here is open at the top because even people who have been doing something for 20, 30 years still have an opportunity to learn. And in fact, the best, the most deeply smart people are eager to learn. So let me tell you a story about a master. About 30 years ago, there were two companies that were competing for um, a US defense contract. They were missile companies. And they both, each company set up, sent up six missiles. All 12 of these prototype missiles failed. In one company, a scientist who wasn't directly involved with this particular missile, but who knew a lot about missile development, decided to take it upon himself to spend a week thinking about and redesigning that missile. And then for four hours, in an auditorium like this, he walked through every bit of the missile that had failed. And he made suggestions on the software, the firmware, and the hardware. And as a result of his uh, accomplishments and his ability to tell people about the deep smarts that he had, that company went on to create a missile that they're still producing 30 years later. So his deep smarts underlay an innovation that was extremely important to that company. <clears throat> so some of the very most valuable information in your company actually exists in the heads and the hands of very experienced people. And a lot of that knowledge is tacit. And what I mean by tacit, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a minute, is that it's undocumented, and it's often not even articulated. That makes it difficult, again, to preserve and to transfer to other people. So deep smarts, here they are. People who have good judgment, people who uh, know a lot about your company, know how to get things done in your company, in your industry. Uh, they often have networks that are extremely important, uh, professional networks, and they are the go-to people in your company. Usually, they're pretty obvious, but not always. <clears throat> So what are the indicators of deep smarts? I'd like you to think about some people in your company, in your organization, who have some of these characteristics. They're kind of a cluster of characteristics. I don't mean that they're, um, they're independent of each other, but let me give you an example of a couple of them. First of all, there's technical. And I don't mean just science or engineering. There's also finance and sales and marketing. But that's one of the obvious places that we see a lot of deep smarts in science and engineering and finance and so forth, technical knowledge. The system perspective is another 
characteristic of a deeply smart person. And that one <clears throat> is a little less obvious, but it's, it's, it, if you talk to a person who is deeply smart, they often have this ability to anticipate what the outcomes of any given decision would be, to be able to look down the road and see what, let's say, the cost in manufacturing of a prototype would be. And so they are constantly thinking about the interdependencies of various aspects of a product line or a, or a service. Judgment, another place that we see deep smarts. I've been uh, working with uh, NASA JPL, Jet Propulsion Lab, on a, on a case study of their Mars 2020 project. As that, in, as that indicates, you know, Mars 2020, they're going to go to Mars again. It's based on a project that is already completed and what they call the Curiosity rover is already on Mars doing its thing. And they have a dilemma that causes, the, that uh, necessitates thinking about risk versus cost every single day because they uh, were funded on the proposition that they could do this project less expensively if they reused the equipment, the software and the hardware that went into the Curiosity rover. But that means that they have to balance that against their ability to complete the mission. And the mission is much more complex. Whereas rover was supposed to walk around and pick up four samples of Mars material and return it to Earth, now they have to pick up 31 samples and they have to cache it there for future uh, expeditions. So uh, context awareness, I think that one's pretty obvious. All of us know about different uh, customer segments and so forth. You know that you're going to be uh, taking context into account. Deeply smart people can make very fine distinctions about different contexts. And then there's diagnostics. I once worked with a company, a beer company. Now, what I know about beer, you can sort of put in my left ear and not find it when you need it. But fortunately, my husband's a little smarter, and so he was able to be my consultant on this. And in this beer company, there was a vice president who was promoted. And uh, what they discovered was they were missing something that he was very good at. He was a very good, he, he had very good diagnostics. When he went into a retail store, he could tell you a lot about the distributor and whether they were a good distributor for their product or not. And he had certain cues that he looked for, the way that they promoted the material, the, the, uh, the beer, the way that they placed it on the shelves, the way that they uh, advertised it, and so forth. And he was actually so good at that that they were able to kind of codify that and his ability to diagnose and pass that along to some other people. And then there's pattern recognition. I, we started the, when we first started research on the book Deep Smarts, we went to Silicon Valley, and actually it was a three-year project. We went around the world. But one of the things that we were looking at was how venture capitalists and mentor capitalists, people who put their own money into uh, firms, what they were doing with these less experienced, sometimes very inexperienced, entrepreneurs to help them to midwife their, um, their ventures into existence. And we found that they would often say <coughs> things like, well, you know, after you've seen, after you've hired and fired hundreds of people, you begin to get a sense of what's going to happen. You can kind of look at a team that is presented to you. You can say, mm, uh, I've seen this before. I can pretty well know what's going to happen next. So they had this terrific pattern recognition. And then there's networks. Deeply smart people know other smart people. In the 1980s, when Monsanto decided that they were going to get into biotech, they didn't have anybody who knew anything about biotech. So they hired one man, Dr. Howard Schneiderman, and then they used his networks to expand into an area that they knew nothing about because he knew people in that area who could help them. And finally, there's creativity, you know, the ability to deal with novelty. Uh, you heard this morning, or yes, it was this morning, uh, Peter Cohn was talking about IDEO. In fact, you've heard several people talk about IDEO because IDEO is one of these companies that has a lot of creativity and they have a process by which that they go through. And when I first got to know them, it, that process was not widely understood. I've called it empathic design because it's a process of going out and understanding empathically 
what people want but cannot necessarily articulate. So they have very deep smarts in this process that they have developed. And you will find that there are people throughout your company who have creativity in processes and ways of thinking, critical thinking. So I'm going to argue that deep smarts are really critical to your ability to innovate. And they underlie new product and service development. Let's just take one example. Peter Cohen was talking about incremental innovations. And many of those come from a platform technology. 3M has been around for well over 100 years. And if you think about some of their technology that underlies whole streams of products, they date way back. And that company, there are people who know more about adhesives and about microstructures than you will find in other companies. They started, uh, for example, being able to produce these, uh, these masks started actually way back with their ability to produce sashin decorative ribbon, which was an invention way back in the 1930s when an, uh, a researcher figured out how to create non-woven webs of fibers. He was given, by the way, three months to come up with some way uh, to use this commercially. And that's, what sashin, uh, that's when sashin rib ribbon came into account. So it started with this ability to compress cellulose fibers. Then we started with the sashin tape. Then uh, that became a platform a whole, for a whole bunch of products. I'll just follow one product line through a little bit. Uh, the ability to blow microfibers into a web, which then in turn led to embedding the particles in the web, which led to uh, electrically charging those particles so that the dust that might otherwise go in your face was attracted to the particles, and finally, a very low cost. It's an example of how the knowledge kind of flows through and underlay. And there, I could give you examples from that same one technology platform of many different product lines that came out of that. <clears throat> Deep smarts also allow entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs to enter totally new businesses. In the 1980s, 1990s, uh, in Fort Payne, Alabama, there were 120 mills making socks. And there were about 7,500 people employed there. When that business moved overseas, a lot of those mills went out of business. In 2008, and you remember what 2008 was like? <laughs> it was not a good time to start a business. And yet this young woman, Tina Locklear, went to her parents, who owned a mill, and said, I got this great idea. I want to go green. We are going to make organic cotton socks, fashion socks, with wild prints and colors and so forth. And her parents, who by that time probably were uh, I don't know, smoking something, uh, said, OK, go ahead and try it. The point, however, is that she could never have done this if she had not had the help of the plant manager. His name was Vance Veal, 48-year-old man who had been working in the plant since he was 18. And he made those machines do things that they never thought they could do. I don't mean the machines never thought they could do. I mean, the people in the factory didn't think the machines could do. But she couldn't have done it. And as she said, you know, if he left, boy, she, she didn't know what she'd do. <clears throat> so that was an example of you know, deep smarts underlying it. Let me give you another example. Grace Manufacturing. Originally, they were in the business of making uh, steel bands for computers. This is back in the dark ages of computers, OK? And those were super sharp. In fact, they said that you could always trace your way to the Band-Aid station by seeing the drops of blood along the floor. So they were very good at making very sharp things. But then times changed, and uh, computers no longer needed these steel bands. So what do we do? What can we make when we're so good at making sharp things? <laughs> and so they first turned to woodworking. They made some very great uh, woodworking material. But if any of you work in the kitchen with some of their uh, zesters, they're fabulous. Just watch your fingers, because they are very sharp. But that has become a terrific business for them. <clears throat> Deep smarts also enable improvisation when you need it. Some of you will remember January 17, 2009, when there was an Airbus that took off from JFK Airport and sucked birds into the 
engines, and the, both engines failed, remember that? And they had to land on the Hudson? Well, Captain Sully Sullenberger um, had a special mental weapon in that he was a glider pilot. So he knew how to fly engineless planes, and that helped him. And it also probably saved a lot of lives. Deep smarts, lots of deep smarts. <clears throat> One of my um, favorite examples of deep smarts underlying invention is a really old one, and I'll tell you why this amuses me. You remember, perhaps, the story of how the, micro the microwave was invented. It started with uh, Percy Spencer, and he was standing in front of a Megatron, and a candy bar in his pocket began to melt. Now, other people had noticed that there was heat emanating or some sort of vibration emanating from the Megatron, but he was the first one to say, hmm, let's find out what's going on. And what he sent out for, and this is why it amuses me, <clears throat> he sent out for corn, popcorn, put it in the Megatron, and of course it popped. Now, the reason it amuses me is that for all the time that that marketeers have tried to convince us that we could, we could fix Thanksgiving dinner in our microwave. Almost every microwave I've ever seen has a button that says popcorn. And that's one of the major uses. So he didn't know that he was starting a trend, but he was. <clears throat> now, that's all the positive side. And you want to know who those people are, and I'm going to talk in a minute about why I think you need to think hard about identifying them and transferring some of their knowledge. But let's also admit, experts can kill creativity, they can kill good ideas. You know, remember when Ken Olson didn't think that maybe it was a good idea to have a computer in the home? He wasn't quite correct. And then there's the Yale management professor who told Fred, Fred Smith, yeah, that, that idea is never going to work. And he went on to found FedEx. And you heard this morning about Kodak. Uh, Peter was talking about how Kodak um, missed its chance. Well, so did Polaroid. And for very similar reasons, Polaroid had an electronic imaging division. They had a lot of expertise. They were on their way. In fact, they had a very good prototype of an electronic camera, a digital camera. But they couldn't convince people in the company for very similar reasons to that in Kodak, because the business model was razor, razor blades. We make our money from film. And therefore, and what's more, one more idea? Customers need prints, solid prints. And therefore, this is a stupid idea. So by the time they finally got to the market, there were 40 other companies there. So yeah, experts can act as barriers to innovation. And of course, this is a fellow who didn't know his market very well. So this is the reason why we need to think about business-critical uh, knowledge. That's the other part of the definition. Experience-based is very important, but so is critical, business-critical. That part of the definition is also extremely important. We suggest that there are, th there are three steps you need to go through. You need to figure out, OK, what knowledge do we need to preserve? match the that knowledge to a transfer strategy and then embed it in the organization. So let me start there. Step one, OK, what is the knowledge that we need to preserve? Who is it that's really critical to us, who, uh, who really understands where we're going and has the knowledge that underlies our innovation? And we have to think about keeping that knowledge for innovation in our company. In 2004, when Boeing decided that they were going to produce what was at the time one of the most revolutionary airliners that had ever been produced, the Dreamliner, they looked ahead and they said, you know, we've got a window of opportunity here. The, the silver tsunami is coming. That is, we're going to lose a lot of our engineers in just a couple of years. So if we don't now make if we do not create the Dreamliner now, we may not have the opportunity to. And as you see from the quote, John Tracy, he realized that they weren't going to be able to just write down how to, write, how to create the next airplane. So a lot of that knowledge was in their heads. It hadn't been documented, despite all of the plans, all of the design. Believe me, this company is very systematic. 
and they have wonderful IT, but still a lot of it is in the heads and the hands of their engineers. And another story from Boeing is a story about how to bring expertise together from two different areas, two different silos. Boeing was the prime leader in the design and creation of the space station. They also designed Apollo 13. So the space exploration division of Boeing is extremely experienced. They know all about space and how to create vehicles that can go up in space. They know about you know, heat resistance and all of the problems you have to think about. But they've always designed for astronauts. I mean, would you want to climb into that Apollo 13? So when they were asked to create a reusable space vehicle, one that would go up and come back down, take things to the space, the space station, and also take space tourists, they really didn't have the concept of, let's say, the client experience. So what happened was that a woman who'd only been there for about five years at Boeing, but came from the commercial side, joined forces with them to help them think about creating a reusable space vehicle that had the feel of a commercial Boeing airliner. And that's what was important in bringing those two streams together of, of smarts from different areas, reaching across those silos. And deep smarts don't always exist visibly. One time, some years ago, I was having lunch with uh, the, the C-suite I was on the 44th floor of a uh, steel company um, headquarters in Pittsburgh. And halfway through the meal, the CEO leaned over towards me and he said, you're a management professor. Yeah, well, that's true. I know the next thing that's going to happen is he's going to ask me you know, how to do something. Sure enough, he said, I have some people I need to fire, and I want to know how to do it humanely. I said, OK, um, what do they do? He said, well, they're advanced sales. Oh, OK, well, what does advanced sales do, I said. He looked across the, uh, the table to his uh, CFO, and he said, George, uh, tell Dorothy what advanced sales does. And George sort of <clears throat> looked uncomfortable and shifted his silverware a little bit, looked down the table and said to the head of HR, hey, Mary, can you tell Dorothy? Well, you get the point. Nobody at that table had the faintest idea what advanced sales did. So I got permission to go down and talk to advanced sales. By the way, they were way down. Uh, I had to take a different elevator to get to them. You know that kind of thing. So when I got to advanced sales, what did I find? I found that there were some very deep smarts there. In fact, there was, each of them had a, a territory. And the man who had uh, Washington, D.C. and the area as his territory knew that working its way through Congress was a piece of legislation that was very likely to pass that would affect how residential furnaces were built because it was going to regulate the, uh, the emissions in such a way that noxious fumes would have to be trapped in the flue of the residential furnace. That meant that the steel there had to be extremely resistant to corrosion. But he knew that in their Nuclear division, they had steel like that. So all they had to do was import it over to the residential section. And that's what he arranged to do. Now, by that single act, they were two years way or more ahead of their competition. Had he paid for the, the, uh, the salaries of his entire group? Yeah, for about 10 years. So there are some deep smarts sometimes that aren't always obvious. I'll just let you read that one. So I'd like to persuade you that you need to think about deep smarts and that you want to preserve them, pass them along in your organization because they are essential to innovation. They underlie the core capabilities of your organization. They're in the heads and hands of people who really know how to get things done. Now, that does not mean that you're going to take these subject matter experts or these uh, management professors uh, not management professors, heaven forbid, these, man these managers, and clone them. You can't. What you can do, however, is figure out what they know that can be preserved and passed along. 
It's not that you want exactly the same people. You do want some of that knowledge passed along. Now, so there are two things you need to know, at least two. One is, who is it? You know, who has some of this critical knowledge? Who are the go-to people? Who are the people who are always on call, who are our experts? They may or may not be totally visible, but they have knowledge that we need. And secondly, what form is that knowledge in? Now, some of it may be explicit. It may be written down. Some of it may be in memos. Some of it may be in presentations, in reports. But you can't just say to someone, go read you know, a, a whole um, filing, the equivalent of a filing cabinet full of electronic reports. That's not going to transfer the knowledge. Because a lot of knowledge is implicit. Now, what I mean by implicit is that it's in your head, and you kind of organized it. You, it's kind of top of head. If I ask you about it, you may be able to tell me some of it. Some of it may be in rules of thumb, for example. When I was working with the US Treasury one time, I, I asked a Secret Service, uh, an experienced Secret Service man, what are some of the rules of thumb that you use to help newbie uh, ser Secret Service people? And he said, well, here's one. Um, when you go out for crowd control, don't look for the noisy people and the active people. They're, they're not dangerous. It's the quiet ones. Look for the quiet ones. They're your source of danger. Now, it's just a rule of thumb. But think how much you would be helped by just a simple rule of thumb like that. So implicit knowledge often takes the form of rules of thumb or of stages or steps that you can go through. But it's not been written down. It's not in any manuals. And then there is tacit knowledge. And tacit knowledge is not only not written down, it's often not articulated. You know, in World War II, there were plane spotters. These were people who were supposed to tell and inform the ground artillery when planes came overhead, are these coming to bomb us, or are they our planes returning? Now, how do you tell that? You tell it by the noise of the engine. But can you imagine trying to describe to somebody well, see, it's more of a growl than, you know, it's a little louder than a, you know, well, it's, a, anyway, you can't. So what they did was they would train people by having them stand by someone who understood and have them say yes or no until they got it. And uh, so tacit knowledge is often referred to as intuition or know-how. Now, I'd like to, like to show you just one little example. So, Dan, do we have everything we need for this meeting? It's all right here, sir. Is your data backup as reliable as it should be? Don't worry, sir. He told me everything. Ours is Brightstore Storage Software. From Computer I just, Associates. I don't have any stock in that company. I just love the ad, and I got permission to use it. Because I think it's, it just illustrates something that's kind of fun. So let me suggest to you that a lot of the knowledge that you want to preserve in your company is implicit, or it's tacit. And as the tacit is especially important. It's also hard to retrieve. But it can be retrieved. Let me give you an example. A colleague of mine at MIT. Gary Klein has written a couple of books about intuition and about uh, tacit knowledge. And he tells a story that I really like. It's a story about a fire lieutenant who, with his team, was fighting a fire in a bungalow in a residential area. And uh, as the team was pouring on water and fighting the fire, all of a sudden, the fire lieutenant said, get out, get out. And hearing the urgency in his voice, they all retreated quickly. And seconds later, the, st the floor that they had been standing on collapsed into a basement they didn't even know was there. So he saved their lives. When Gary asked him, well, how did you know that? He said, intuition. Intuition, I submit to you, is very fast pattern recognition. And when Gary persisted, he was able to get some of the cues that that fire lieutenant was, was using almost unconsciously. He recognized that the fire was very quiet that there was too much smoke for the amount of flames, that the, the water they were pouring on wasn't getting the response he expected. So what was going on? He didn't, real, he didn't think through, analytic. oh, there must be a basement here. No, he just thought, it's not here. It's not here. Drew his men out, and then they realized 
that the fire was not where they thought it was. So that's an example of kind of tacit knowledge that people have, and they will tell you, your managers and your SMP, your uh, subject matter experts, if you ask them how they made a decision, they may tell you intuition or gut feel. What they're really doing is very, very fast pattern recognition. So suppose you understand who your people are, and you have some idea that a lot of the knowledge actually may be in their heads and not articulated, then you have to figure out, okay, what's my strategy for transferring? And there are basically, basically any strategy that I tell you about involves pushing and pulling. The SMEs or your highly experienced employees have to be willing to push, put out the knowledge. But their recipients, the successors, the learners have to be willing to learn how to pull better too. And both of those are skills. The pushing and the pulling are both skills. And there are two variables that determine basically what your strategy will be. One is, is the time. How much time do I have? Are these people, say that I have a, a person who's really, really very deeply smart, are they here for another week, another month, another couple of years? How much time do I have? And secondly, how much of the knowledge in this person's head has been, in fact, captured in design plans and so forth and in pro processes? And how much of it is still in his or her head? And that determines your strategy. And in uh, the, the most recent book that we've written, Critical Knowledge Transfer, we've tried to suggest different ways depending upon the time that you have and how much knowledge you have or what kind of knowledge you have. So first of all, there's, there's smart questioning. That's just basically exit interviews, but, but some, putting some structure to it, asking some specific questions that seem to elicit a lot of knowledge. Then you can do sessions of smart questioning. When we were working with a financial firm, uh, they'd undergone, uh, they're a firm that exists in the world of trade and uh, finance, and they'd undergone a lot of trauma, as most of those firms have, during some of the financial crises that we've had. And one of their people, very experienced person, was ready to leave, and he actually was leaving rather unexpectedly because of some problems. And so they had a very short time to figure out what this guy knew. And we sat, we sat with this man in a room with his reports and his peers, and he said, as experts tend to do sometimes, hey, everybody in this room knows what I know. Well, his reports were sitting there just rolling their eyes and perspiring a little bit because they said, no, we don't. First of all, we can't pick up the phone and call the same people you can to get information because they won't respond to our telephone calls. But more importantly, we have no idea how you gathered the information that you did that put into the reports about these crises, nor how you handled the media, nor how you, you know, decided what was risky and what wasn't. So they, he really didn't understand how much was unknown. So, but by questioning, not only our questioning, but the questioning by his peers and by his reports, we got a lot more out in several sessions. And then there's something called discovery. What I mean by discovery, and now I go back to the point that people need to learn how to pull knowledge. By discovery, I mean that the people who need the knowledge, the recipients, the successors, can need to discover some of it for themselves. If you want to get at some of the tacit knowledge, some of the critical thinking. And the way you, that the Army has done it, as an example of discovery, and you know they, they have to take people who uh, are really very unaccustomed to um, and may not be terribly educated and are going to go into some very complex situations. So they will have, let's say, a major come, and in an auditorium or when in a group of, of uh, less experienced people, the major will give uh, basically a little case study. So here's one. I just sent my platoon out in a market. They, they dispersed throughout the market. I'm sitting there watching them go into the marketplace in Iraq, and I notice across the way that there's a bus, and on top of the bus is a young man, and he's reaching under his seat to pull something out that has a metallic sheen. I've got a sniper right by me. Do we shoot? Now, those of you who have uh, perhaps seen the movie American Sniper may recall a very similar situation. There's a decision. Now, the major doesn't tell the, the, the group right away what he did. Instead, he gets them to discuss it, to think about it, to figure out all the ramifications of shoot, don't shoot, 
and what information they would want. So the real learning is not in, I decided not to shoot, and it's a good thing because he was pulling out his boom box. The real lesson was in thinking through the situation. And of course, I'm a little biased on this because I spent 20 years at Harvard Business School, and that's how we teach, is through cases. But I do believe that this kind of thinking, what, what one scholar has called uh, desirable difficulty, in other words, not always having the, hand, ha the answer given to you, but having to really struggle with it, that embeds some of this knowledge. And then there's, if you have time, structured knowledge mentoring. That's not this, quite the same as just mentoring. It's a deliberate attempt to focus on the knowledge that needs to be transferred, that's critical to your company, and then uh, pairing up or matching people who want the knowledge and can use the knowledge with people who have the knowledge. And uh, in, in our book, The Critical Knowledge Transfer, we spend a whole chapter on describing how this was done at GE's uh, research centers. Because you know they have these scientists who have hundreds, quite literally hundreds, of patents to their name. And when those guys leave, the question is, what do we do? So one of the ways to transfer that knowledge is to have the learners experience some of what the expert knows through what we call mini, M-I-N-I, -I, mini experiences. So for example, you might, uh, at GE, they might send um, someone, one, uh, one of their possible successors to a conference with them, uh, give a presentation for them, uh, deal with some clients for them and with them. So it's a learning by doing. And the way that we transfer, ta especially the tacit dimensions of knowledge, is through experience, guided experience. This is, this is a partnering among people so that uh, the, the, uh, the learner, the recipient, observes. For example, at Microsoft, they've now pretty much standardized something that was done almost by accident years ago when a college student, a college graduate, excuse me, um, who is now, by the way, their, their chief marketing officer, first went to be what he calls a Sherpa to Bill Gates. In other words, he was in charge of the luggage and getting people there. And, but what he was also allowed to do was sit in on important meetings with other CEOs and to discuss it afterwards with Bill Gates and find out what he'd observed versus what Bill thought was going on or vice versa. And that was a, such a tremendous experience that now they've pretty well done that with a lot of, of high potential people. Then there's guided practice. In the GE case, uh, sometimes it might be something like the presentation or going to a conference and giving part of the, of the talk or interacting in a meeting or representing um, uh, your company at uh, some convention. But practicing guided practice so that there's constant feedback and review. And then there's guided partnering. And that means actually a partnering between the deeply smart person and the person less experienced. One of the, I think, good examples of a knowledge mentor was someone who took his, this, this happened to be in engineering, he took his junior engineer to the end of the assembly line and he said to her, we're going to solve problems here with the technician that is at the end of the assembly line because that's where all the design mistakes show up. This will help you as a design engineer. Now, you know, most, most design engineers do not go into the assembly plant because that's sort of a different neighborhood. But that's where he took her, and that's where they did, they partnered on solving problems. And it was an extremely valuable experience. So eventually then, the recipient, the successor, the person who is taking over some of the job can take over some of the responsibility. And that's this structured mentoring process, knowledge mentoring process. Finally, you'd like to have knowledge sharing embedded in your processes, in, in everything that you do, particularly, of course, in your succession planning, but also in onboarding. Do people who come into your organization know how to get some of the skills that you're going to need in the future for innovation? Do they know how to get things done in the organization? I was speaking um, this morning with someone who was comparing uh, a person coming into an organization to a baby learning how to walk, you know, sort of all arms and legs and kind of awkward, because they don't know their way through the organization yet. So onboarding means a lot more, doesn't it, than uh, pointing to the, uh, you know, giving the key to the executive washroom. 
It really does involve figuring out how to get things done in this context. So I invite you to think about who in your organization is critical, what their skills are, how much of those skills are still unidentified or at least unarticulated, how can you help them transfer some of that knowledge, and how can you help your newer people absorb and pull some of that knowledge so that you preserve the deep smarts of your organization. So thank you. Uh, we're not, we don't have time for questions, I understand, and we're running a little late, this, so I'm encouraged not to take any questions. But if you have some and they're specific, please send them to me, and I'll do my best to respond. Thank you very much. Thank you.